Hi everyone, my name is Brian Owl. I'm a staff engineer at Uber, and I've been here just over two and a half years. Um, in this time, I've worked on um, how we design the engineering structure of our biggest apps. I've worked on some infrastructure projects, and lately I've been working on performance. It's that last thing, performance, that I'm gonna be focusing on in this talk. Because making mobile apps fast is important. When I and a bunch of other engineers uh, went to India, this became really obvious. Like you could tell that what people who own $40 phones care about the most is, does this app actually work on my $40 phone that is super slow and also in a really network congested place? We could talk about the economics and like overview of this a lot, but I'm gonna do something a little bit different and I'm gonna zone in on one particular technical project and just talk about that for a bit. Okay, so this project started like last month. It's a, it's a little Android centric, but there's been similar projects on iOS. So I think it'll, it'll be approachable um, for everyone. We were taking a look at why different screen transitions in our app fell slow. And we noticed pretty quickly that about half of the time spent inside all these transitions was code that was interacting with the view framework, which is pretty interesting because only 10% of the lines of code inside those transitions were the lines interacting with the view frameworks. So the view frameworks are slow. And it isn't immediately apparent why that needs to be true. It's not like when you set the text on a view, it eagerly renders that onto a canvas or something. No, it does that on a separate thread. So why is setting that text so slow? Um, and as we were thinking about that, we started to wonder about other things, like are our internal frameworks also slow? We know that calling this A-B test function that we wrote one time is not slow, but maybe it adds up and can we figure that out at a glance kind of easily for all of our dozens of frameworks? How do we go about answering that? Actually, how, how do we go about answering that? Like, how would you answer that? Yeah, so you would time it, right? Like you would, you would profile it. And on Android, at least, none of, none of the profilers works for us, um, which, which sounds crazy because doesn't every company care a little bit about performance and want to measure this? Because you think that I'm insane, I'm going to talk a little bit about why this is the case. And let's start with the screen that may be somewhat familiar to a lot of you, and this is the Android Studio Profiler screen. You press the little red button, you toggle the instrumentation, and then it starts instrumenting all your methods. If you dive into the Android source code, and you look at how this is built, you'll see that it's really cool, like it's, it's really beautifully built. The engineers that worked on this, they, did a great job of minimizing the overhead of the instrumentation when your instrumentation is not being used. Which makes sense because if you think about it, like this code ships on every single Android phone and most people are not profiling the apps that they're running. Most people are not even engineers, right? So you shouldn't be adding a ton of overhead. Basically for most users, the only overhead that having this code in your, in your phone adds is a single branch condition in the class linker. And if you don't add it, it's not a big deal. Um, but that's to say that it's pretty low. The situation is really different though when you actually press that red button. When you press that red button, they force your app to run in interpreted mode, which is to say that instead of compiling every single class of bytecode as you hit it like all at once in an optimized way or doing it ahead of time, instead for every single line of, for every single, oh yeah, that's way better. Um, for every single line of bytecode, you're just going to convert it to a similar language one at a time. This makes your app about two times slower. And on top of that, for every single method that they instrument, they execute like 200 lines of C++ code. So if you compare your app with instrumentation next to the version of your app without instrumentation, you're going to notice that your app is orders of magnitude slower. You can guess which one is with instrumentation. Um, you'll still get all of the information. Like you'll be told this method takes this long, this method starts at this time and ends at this time. But you're getting that information about some crazy Alice in Wonderland version of your app that bears no resemblance to the real performance characteristics of your app. Yeah, and also that. So it's not altogether that actionable. If we wait long enough, this will finish eventually, but let's not. Um, so what do we do? We could try building sampling. We could use the one that's built into Android Studio. We could build it ourselves, but every version of sampling has the same problem. And that's for every single sample you take, you have to walk up the stack frame. Uh, there can be 100, it can be 100 deep, it can be 200 deep, especially if you use RxJava. And 
that means that in practice, you're only going to get 10 samples a millisecond on like a medium, medium end phone, which is not even close to good enough to answer the questions that I have, which are like this A-B testing framework that we call a thousand times in our app. Is a hundred nanoseconds too slow? And like, can I answer that without taking a hundred different um, sampling and like without running this for an hour with different samples and then averaging it? No. Um, even if you used the Profilo library's custom NATO stack unwinder, which does deferral of the method name lookup and does that later, it's still too slow. Although if you don't know about that, you should look at the library, it's really cool. So what do we do? Sampling doesn't work. Android Studio's instrumentation doesn't work. We could try building some instrumentation to our app, but then we can only instrument the methods that are part of our app. And earlier on, I said, I want to know why the view frameworks are slow, and those view frameworks are built as a part of the OS. So we've really got only one option now. We've got to pull down the operating system source code, and we've got to mess around with it. We've got to pull down the source code, and let's see if we can find some hooks. Let's look through the art repo inside Android, and we will find a method called execute. Fortunately, it is pretty plainly named, so it's easy to find. Basically, this method executes methods, like bytecode methods. It's super complicated if you look at it, but it's got a beginning, and it's got an end. So I can do this. <laughs> um, and now we know how long it takes for every single interpreted method to get executed. Miserly with the way that we define this. We don't have 100 lines of C++. We have a few with branch hints. And we don't even use the system's built-in clock. Instead, we read from the like, ARM, ARM CPU count registry, which we later convert to time um, when we're writing to disk. Great, so in practice what this means is that we can now get basically exact timing for every single method that's interpreted in our app with about one to 2% overhead, uh, which is to say that it doesn't distort the actual behavior of the app really in any noticeable way. But if you dig into the number of methods in your app that are running in interpreted mode, you'll find that modern versions of Android, they're mostly compiled, which is pretty impressive, but annoying for what I'm trying to do. Well, let's keep looking. There is a compiler in the same repo, and it's well built. If you look at it, it constructs a nice abstract syntax tree, and it appends nodes with names like return void or start method. And where those nodes are attached, we return our own nodes with names like begin trace. <laughs> and when you go and you flatten out this abstract syntax tree, or when Android does, machine instructions that get created for our nodes do things like insert timestamps into buffers. And basically, what that means is that now, we basically know when every single method, whether it's compiled or whether it's interpreted, gets started, gets stopped, how long it takes, whether or not it's in the app or whether or not it's in the framework, and all of this with like single digit percentage of overhead instead of 5,000%. Thank you. It's, it's pretty sweet, right? And then we can build custom ROMs of this, yellow cases on it so we don't forget that these are special phones and hand them out around the office. And sometimes they get smudgy, but the important thing is like now we can use these to answer hard problems. I mentioned a few at the beginning of the talk. Why are the view frameworks are slow? It's actually pretty obvious when you have something like this. They're slow because, uh, actually in our app anyway, they're slow because text resizing is slow. Because the asset manager calls when used with theming and resources are slow because of class loading. And also sometimes they're just badly written. And uh, in the places where we care to dig into this, we can mitigate that by a lot. We can make like, basically all the view interactions three times faster. I think I asked another question. I asked, are our frameworks slow? Yeah, they were. And we can see that now. There were about 30% of the time that we spent on any interaction in our app. Now that we can see that, we can get that down to 5%. It wasn't even that much work. What this looks like here in, in like the US is the app feels a bit better. But in India, now when you tap on a button, instead of it taking two seconds to interact, which is just frustrating and kind of like rude, I think, it's going to take a few hundred milliseconds, which is basically instantaneous to the human eye. And people are going to feel good about our app. So great, this was like a successful project and it was also fun. So double bonus champagne all around. I earlier on mentioned that uh, some of the things I did here, right? Like I, I joined as barely a senior engineer. And while I've been here, I've gotten to do a bunch of cool stuff like co-design our biggest apps, do infrastructure stuff, do fun perf things like this with other great engineers. And these are not opportunities that I would have had if I had stayed working at the South Bay Megacorp that I was at before Uber. And the reason that Uber is different is because we're, really young for a company this big with this many resources. 
Like we have tons of large, challenging, and interesting problems that we've just starting to dig into, 